Hello and welcome to the Eden Mills Writers Festival online series In Your Own Backyard. My name is Nicola Duffesey and I'm the festival's artistic director. Although we are gathering virtually, we would like to recognize and offer our respect to the Attawandron people and the Mississaugas of the New Credit on whose traditional territory the village of Eden Mills resides. May we who dwell on or visit this land and these waters be good stewards and honor those who came before us through positive action. Welcome to this showcase event where we will feature the winners of the 2021 Read at the Fringe contest. The Eden Mills Writers Festival is committed to providing a venue for emerging writers to showcase their work. Throughout the decade long history of our writing contest, winners have shared with us the significance of the recognition they received, the excitement of reading their work in the village, the warmth of the audience and the validation and encouragement it gives them. Once again, we are grateful to the publication studio, PS Guelph, with whom we have once again partnered for their ongoing support of this contest, including the publication of a chapbook of the winning entries available for sale at the web address you see on your screen. Before you hear from our contest winners, I'd like to congratulate the runners up in each category. We wish them all the best in their future writing careers. Congratulations, everyone. Now to introduce you to the winners of this year's Read at the Fringe contest. This year's winner in the fiction category is Amber Fennick for Burial. Amber Fennick was born and raised in Perth, Ontario, where she heard many local ghost stories. She has thwarted death on several occasions and enjoys spending time alone with her cat. Contrary to popular belief, she is not afraid of the dark. I would now like to invite Amber to read from her award-winning work. Welcome, Amber. Hello, my name is Amber Fennick, and today I'm going to be reading you my short story called Burial. A month after the death of her husband, she woke to find that the cat had also died. She stumbled into the kitchen, still half asleep, to feed him. Usually, the sound of the cup crunching into the bag of cat food and the clattering stream of kibbles spilling into his bowl sent him frantically racing through the house. Instead, he remained a motionless lump of fur. Slowly creeping over to the cat bed in the corner of the living room, she nudged him with the socked toe of her foot. Crouching down and laying one hand on his side confirmed it. His body was stiff and ice cold. Really? she uttered in an exasperated tone. It wasn't much of a surprise, to be honest. Meow Meow had been ancient by any veterinarian standards, and it was more of a shock that he was still kicking around after so long, having clearly outlived the normal lifespan of other felines. The cat had been her husband's, rescued back in his college days. Despite the cat's clearly demonstrated preference for her husband and low tolerance for her, she still couldn't help but feel a sense of betrayal over the fact that Meow Meow had so willingly and easily abandoned her in her time of need to go bounding over the rainbow bridge after him instead. Leaving her with yet another body to bury salted the still open wounds. Fucking asshole, she muttered under her breath. She slipped on her boots and headed over to the rickety shadow back. They had purchased the house three months earlier, so she prayed that whoever had inhabited it before had owned a shovel. Working her way around the packed shelves of the shed, she found it disconcerting to rummage through other people's things. It was technically now her property, but the accumulated junk reflected another person's life and was entirely unfamiliar to her. Empty peanut butter containers filled with nails, railway lanterns with broken glass bulbs, a disintegrating deck chair. In a rusted coffee tin, she discovered a crumpled pack of cigarettes and a matchbook squirreled away by a naughty teenager or a secretive spouse. She sent up a silent thank you to whoever left them behind, lit one up, and breathed the poison deeply into her lungs. Watching her smoky breath curl up into the air and then dissipate as it hit the sheet of rain pouring down from bleak skies, she thought about her husband. Expired. Perished. Deceased. None of the words that described his current state of being quite fit into her new reality. They didn't feel right. 
He hadn't been a fan of smoking either, encouraging her to quit soon after they started dating. I don't want you to die a long, slow, painful death from cancer, he had argued. Unfortunately, he was not given the same luxury of time due to a quick, fast, hopefully painless death from a semi-tractor trailer after the driver fell asleep at the wheel and blew right through a concrete median. Their car had been flattened like a pancake. There was no way he could have survived that, the cop on scene had told her. In some sort of attempt at comfort, staring at the completely unrecognizable wreckage of their four-door sedan, she felt that his comments seemed rather pointless, considering that her husband's body was essentially liquid gelatin after being crushed like an insect in a tin can. She wasn't entirely sure how to be a widow either. It wasn't a club that she had ever thought she would join, especially at such a young age. She understood on some level that women usually outlived men, but she figured she would need to come to terms with it much later on, in old age, as a natural part of life. The only role model that she could think of to look up to was Queen Victoria, and that was depressing, even by widow standards. She couldn't spend the remainder of her possibly long and healthy life in this hellish fog of grief. The emotional pain was one thing, but her husband's death had knocked her into an alternative timeline. The life they had planned together was no more, and she felt like she was floating around aimlessly, navigating an unfamiliar landscape of which she wanted no part. Many a night, late into the evening or the early hours of the morning, she had woken to the sounds of the floorboards creaking below and thought it was her husband, sleepless and restlessly puttering around downstairs. A wave of comfort had washed over her as she listened carefully, wondering if she, should soon, if she would soon see the space underneath their bedroom door light up from a reading lamp, or hear the sound of voices from the television as he found some way to entertain himself. Then the agonizing realization would hit once again hit. Her husband was not, in fact, roaming around their house and after a bout of insomnia. He was actually six feet underground in Pleasant Hill Cemetery. Urn, not casket, as there wasn't much left of him to bury and the noises were instead coming from the nighttime antics of one Meow Meow the cat. That stupid old feline had given her hope, and although those brief, few brief moments of forgetfulness had been just as quickly snatched away as her brain finally cut up with her heart, they had been moments of desperately needed respite from the brutally dismal world in which she was forced to live. Without Meow Meow, what did she have now? Finishing the cigarette, she stubbed it out on the workbench in the back corner of the shed. She grabbed the hefty shovel that she had found in the corner amidst a pile of assorted gardening tools and headed back out into the deluge. Once again in the kitchen, she leaned against the counter, contemplating her next move. She fought the urge to light up another cigarette, as stale as they were. It had felt good to give a little fuck you to the life she had before. Time was now painfully spliced into before the semi and after the semi. Glancing out the window, it seemed to be darker outside than it was a few minutes prior, and the rain was now coming down much harder than before. Raining buckets, her husband would have said, back when all his body had been in one piece and roaming around the earth, above ground, carefree. Biting her thumbnails with a quick, she made her decision. She couldn't keep the cat's body inside the house. It would smell. Or on the porch, animals would get to it. She also knew that if she put it in the freezer to deal with later, she would inevitably forget, and then someday, when pulling out a microwave meal for one, come unexpectedly face to face with the frozen corpse of Meow Meow. That thought made her simultaneously want to throw up and burst out laughing. She carefully wrapped Meow Meow in his favorite blanket, along with its most savagely victimized toy mouse. After a moment's hesitation, she also tucked a picture of her husband, pulled off of the refrigerator into the sad little bundle. It somehow felt right. Despite the downpour, she was able to dig a deep, good-sized hole in the pitch black soil fairly quickly. She admittedly was helped along in the process by the intense rage she had over that had overtaken her soul. Every time the shovel speared the ground and she flung a drenched pile of mud over her shoulder, it was as if she was fighting back against her fate, punishing the universe on behalf of her husband and his loyal pet. It was awful to put what had once been a living, breathing thing into that dark, watery pit. She was overwhelmed by guilt, like she was somehow throwing her husband's beloved cat away. It took everything in her to drop that first clump of dirt over his body. 
After being in the rain for so long, she was drenched. Admittedly, it was probably a good thing. She had been wearing her husband's t-shirt and pajama pants for the past few weeks and had likely begun to smell. Of course, there was no one around to confirm her suspicions. Unsure of what type of eulogy to deliver to consecrate the burial, she hesitated, standing on top of the fresh mound of earth. Fuck you, meow meow, she said finally, tears streaming down her face. She began sobbing, leaning against the handle of the shovel for support. Doubled over, she let all out all of the grief that had begun to drown her. Sometime later, when she had quieted and the torn had eased to a trickle, she turned away from the burial plot and headed back inside the now empty house. She decided to take a hot shower and make herself a cup of tea with honey. And that was good enough for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that, Amber, and congratulations. The judges of this year's fiction category were C.S. Okineda and Eddie Budel Tan, both published authors who have new book, books out this year. We thank them for their time. Next up, we'll hear from the winner of the non-fiction category, Victoria Abood, for Lessons. Victoria's writing traces the trauma of longing and the complexities of generational memory as experienced through the hyphen, that space between and among the distinct yet connected communities and cultural identities. Her first published piece of creative nonfiction, Lineage, is forthcoming in the Michigan Quarterly Review. She lives in Windsor, Ontario. Victoria joins us now to read from her winning piece. Welcome, Victoria. Hi, my name is Victoria Aboud. I'd first like to thank the judges for selecting my piece for uh, for the Fringe this year. Uh, as well, thank you to all the folks behind the scenes who make the Fringe and the Eden Mills Writers Festival possible. Um, and congratulations to the winners of the other categories. I'm really looking forward to hearing you recite your pieces uh, and I appreciate being part of this lineup. The excerpt I'm going to read for, for you, of course, is from my submission uh, and it's called Lessons. When we pause from the Ajam Do Makam, the scale in Do or C major that spans the middle section of my 78 string kanoon, we talk of home and hope and loss. Our pigeon of English, French, and Arabic, both Fusha and Levantine, pulls us through the mandals of the instrument and we tiptoe along the bridge, breathing in deeply, seeking the warmth of the sunshine that hardened the walnut that now sits on our laps. On the air in that breeze where women washed their families' clothes on the banks beyond the edge of the village, the sounds of gossip and rebuke and the unspoken regrets of middle age waft through the air and reverberate through the filigree holes in the soundboard. Nabil and I mark our geographies in these octaves. My eyes narrow and focus on the treble clef in the sheet music while Nabil listens for the sounds that follow with each beat in his heart. Waves of notes are carried on each pulse gracefully along through him and back to the collective memories of a pastoral history that exists now through Instagram hotties seeking cultural experiences as they traipse through the countryside in search of authenticity and the reminders of why the scent of Zatar and Zeit over wood-burning flames feels like home. Tension mounts and I hear the sharp and flat notes, diez will be mold that sound like the momentary screech of the landing gear rubber hitting the tarmac. Hamdallah salami, they shout to us, thank God for your safe arrival. As we respond with yasin hamdkun, the sounds are squeezed from the ground. Our relief, the joys of reunions are in a higher octave, into the heart and spirit at once. The sound I am seeking is in the snap of small molecules of saliva that leave Abu Riyad's lips when he kneels down his aged hips and long haul flight stiffness forcing him into an awkward position to kiss the ground of his homeland. Ah, ya baladi, he releases, oh, my country. Our memories are built from the sounds of skipping records that broadcast the applause and static of Wadiya al-Safi concerts in smoky halls filled with clean shaven men with gelled hair and pronounced side parts, while gorgeous ladies in bouffant hairstyles and implausibly blonde hair sit bolt upright 
while the breeze from their clapping lifts the layers of chiffon that cascade down their arms to the ends of their galois cigarettes. Our sounds open to the hope that was nestled in the hearts of expatriate parents struggling to find where those ends met, setting sights on the next paycheck that could be divided into here and there. Sent with effendi or acquaintances in small white airmail envelopes edged with red and blue hash marks and scribbled with letters of updates and lies about everyone's wellness, lest old mothers and young siblings imagine their family struggling over the mountains across the ocean. From the ends of Du Maurier's in their bright red boxes come the memories translated into neat handwriting by greasy fingernails that worked double shifts so that that envelope would be thick enough to last three months. Inshallah, it will last more. Generations of brothers and sisters grieving losses through scratchy telephone connections amidst the sound of air raids, the rubble settling into the lungs and weighing their hearts deeper into the grounds of homeland. And me of this quiet neighborhood in this less quiet city, watching and weeping through layers of television glass and internet cables and the thick air across the ocean. My ache is the ache of generations. The longing of a past that only some, like my father, like Nabil's father, remember. Most of us have known only the now that overlaps progress and history, peacefulness and deceit, nostalgia and discontentment. They begin to coalesce as I find Ajam Do and the crispness of Tremolo. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the Fringe. Thank you, Victoria. That was wonderful. The judges of this year's nonfiction category were Julia Zarankin and Andrea Bennett, both former winners of this contest and now published authors. Thank you, Andrea and Julia. And now to our final winner of the poetry category, Gillian Reed for Thomas of the Broken Heart. Gillian Reed writes all of her poetry outdoors and on the notes app of her phone. She is a multidisciplinary artist who has shown work at the Toronto Sketch Festival, the Vancouver Outsider Arts Festival, and the Fruit Market Gallery. Her latest project is The Sick Girl Missives, which can be found on Instagram. I'd like to welcome Gillian Reed to present Thomas of the Broken Heart. <laughs> Bedsheet Moon at 7 p.m. I saw the moon halved tonight, white as silk napkins folded like swan wings, swan wings folded like silk napkins, my own skull. That is my list of white things, none are good enough, one is cheating. A ghost, when asked if they wouldn't mind flying up into the sky to paint the moon, sick from eating bad beans, lost all its glow, must have floated up with the long white sheet that they wear on special occasions, just to be funny. And they must have draped that sheet over the moon, eye holes as pretend craters. That, that funny ghost's bed sheet. That was the color of the moon tonight. Thomas of the Broken Heart, written after reading the poem Space Struck by Paige Lewis. Did you know that if you line your fingers up just right and have them dance a little jig, but only if they do the exact right steps, no tripping, somewhere a little whistle blows and a door the size and shape of an apple seed will open in the empty air before you and spit a white ribbon out of its bitter brown mouth. The ribbon will read, the first meteorite to strike a human being hit in 1954. Before this, there was a friar, back when people wore robes and ate apples straight off of trees. He died but we can't even begin to believe that he was the first because no one, not even one person, had the decency to take a picture of him lying on the ground, robes spiraled around him like one of the showier galaxies. I was busy loading this white ribbon into the ratty steamer trunk I carry with me for moments exactly like this, when four otters, one with a fat fish in its mouth, 
slid their silken bodies past floating beer cans and green scum, lifted themselves onto the rock-lined shore, brushed their bellies against the grit-filled mouths of dead barnacles, ran toward a dense green wall of grasses and shoots, and, knowing the location of their own secret door, disappeared for good and forever. A man, I am being honest now, a man wearing a paper hospital mask and sunglasses, hidden from everyone but the good Lord, sprinted after them, camera raised. He wanted to be believed, I suppose, when he told people that he had seen something with four legs, Crawl out of the sea. Here, open your hand. Here, take this white ribbon. Thomas didn't believe that Jesus had risen on word alone. He wanted to dig into Jesus' split plum side, search for the pit which in Jesus would have hummed and glowed gold. How can we do anything but love Thomas? He probably still had dirt under his nails from scraping at the ground and howling at the unbroken clouds to break and reveal the shining face of his recently broken friend, or, at the very least, a sky-written note from a lesser angel. Don't worry. He's here. Jesus, divine and knowing, able to see every apple seed door, pulled back his robe, said to Thomas, Here. Open your hand, said to everyone else, take a picture. Thank you so much, Jillian. We're so pleased you could join us for this event. The judges of this year's poetry category were poet Lily Wang and publisher of Gordon Hill Press, Jeremy Luke Hill. Thank you, Lily and Jeremy, for joining us this year. That brings us to the end of our event. Thank you to Amber Fennick, Victoria Abood, and Gillian Reed for reading from their work. If you'd like to buy a copy of the Publication Studios chapbook, it is available at the web address you see on screen. The Eden Mills Writers' Festival is dedicated to offering their online events free of charge, but we need your help to sustain the magic of the festival. We are grateful for donations of any amount. And if you enjoyed the, today's event and are in a position to give, please visit our website to donate. The Eden Mills Writers' Festival would also like to thank our festival supporters whose financial support has made this series possible. We have a lot of great programming coming up between now and the end of October. So please check the festival's website for more details. We hope to see you back in Eden Mills in September 2022. Thank you so much for watching.